Now that's a big difference looking at character. It's almost yin and yang of each other. Yet, still, crime movies, all of them. It also leads to storytelling differences, right? Another of the three super genre elements. See, the story will focus on the character who goes through the most change, which is known as the protagonist. Take Silence of the Lambs as an example. Yes, Hannibal Lecter escapes, but it's not an escape movie. It's a cop movie, where the cop is an FBI agent and she's trying to save a woman from a serial killer. We are rooting for Clarice Starling to succeed, not Hannibal Lecter. And that's because the story is told in such a way as to focus on the FBI agent. Lecter becomes her mentor, sure, but Starling is the protagonist. She is the one who changes. She is the character that we follow. But compare that to Cool Hand Luke, where we want the criminal to escape every time. And even though the guards keep catching old Lucas Jackson, we never stop rooting for him. And that's because of the way that the story is told. Luke is given personality. Think about it. The guards are cold and mysterious, but Luke has heart. The guards are heartless. Nothing more than a reflection in the sunglasses to let you know what they're feeling. These are decisions made by the filmmakers, and these are decisions made by the expectations of the macro genre combined with the super genre. The super genre provides the broad strokes, and the macro genre fills in the details. Now, I want to expand this idea out a little bit further in two different directions. First, I want to talk about a different idea, the micro genre. And then I'm going to circle back around to the super genre, macro genre relationship, believe me. By the end, I want to show you how these sorts of relationships can create more than a thousand different possibilities, but ones that you can pretty much predict every single time. Okay, so first, Micro genres. Like I said, there's 50 macro genres, and each macro genre has its own set of micro genres. That's right, each macro has its own micro. For instance, let's look at heist movies. In a heist caper movie, the audience is informed of the protagonist's challenge early on, and the story is dedicated to a band of heroes systematically solving each problem until the robbery is attempted. Keep in mind, heists are rarely accomplished alone, so these films tend to rely on the group as a character. Often there's infighting within the group, as each person is usually been chosen to join the caper because of their unique specialty, safecracker, conman, etc., rather than their ability to work together in small teams. Now, knowing that, a heist movie typically falls into one of three kinds of films. It's either a procedural, an impossible endeavor, or a tale. Procedural, impossible, or tale. Now, here's what I mean by that. Tell me if I'm wrong. Of course, all heists seem to be impossible. That's part of the fun. The question is, where is the focus of the story? Stanley Kubrick, his first feature film, The Killing, which was released in 1956, is the story of an elaborate heist to rob a horse betting track during one of its biggest races. It seems daring, obviously, and often appears impossible. But Kubrick and co-writer Jim Thompson dig into the hows and the whys of the caper. They take the audience step by step, procedurally, through the crime. It makes us feel like we're one of the criminals, creating the plan and making sure that nothing goes wrong. That's a procedural, and the most exciting part for the audience is to feel like they're part of the heist. Now this is in contrast with a film like Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, where the mission is <laughs> seemingly impossible. And yes, they walk through some of the most specific elements of the procedure, but the story isn't told in a way that tries to pull the audience into the fold. Instead, we watch from the sidelines, asking ourselves, how in the hell are they going to pull this off? The visceral enjoyment in this micro comes from not knowing while the excitement in a procedural is created by the knowledge of how the crime is going to be committed. 
And then there's simply the well-told tale about a heist. And again, yes, the caper seems difficult, of course, maybe even impossible. But the story is about the characters themselves. The heist is almost a backdrop. Quentin Tarantino's first film, Reservoir Dogs, is a perfect example. In fact, we don't even see the jewelry store heist, only the aftermath and its preparation. Let's look at another one, the detective macro and its four micros. A detective story, also called a mystery, either way works for me, is focused on a story where the audience peeks over the shoulder of someone, quote, the detective, who is actively trying to solve a crime by following a trail of clues and piecing them together like a puzzle. Quick note, this is different from a police story or a law enforcement story, a cop movie, whatever you want to call it, where the protagonist finds clues, but the story's not about the clues. Clarice Starling in Silence of the Lambs finds some clues, yeah, sure, but we're not really solving the crime with her. The story is about her relationship with Lecter and the memory of her father, not about getting the right clues to fall into place. Not like Sherlock Holmes movies. Those are the detective movies. It's a real mystery, and we try to solve it using clues like Sherlock Holmes. This is a whodunit. That's one of the micros. In a whodunit, we're specifically focused on the detective. For instance, I personally, I love Sherlock Holmes movies. It doesn't really matter what the crime is or who the victim is. I just want to see if Holmes and Watson can figure out the mystery and discover who done it? That's kind of the flip of a crime-specific mystery. In a crime-specific mystery, the audience is more focused on the complexity of the crime than on the intellectual prowess of the detective. Another Robert Downey Jr. movie, Zodiac, directed by David Fincher, uses this microgenre. In Zodiac, the police and newspaper hounds scour for clues to stop the serial killer known as Zodiac. But the focus of the story is on the investigation, not on the investigators. So again, you can see how these first two microgenres dig deeper into the storytelling part of the supergenre. Are we following the detective or are we following the crime? The next two detective microgenres explore and manipulate the atmosphere. You might find that your detective film is referred to as either hard-boiled or pulp. These are terms that harken back to the 1930s and 40s, but the concepts are just as relevant in films today. Both micros are about peeling back the niceties of our society and revealing their dark underbelly. In either one, the audience is shown that there is a dark, sinister world hiding beneath the everyday lives that we live. And even though the terms hard-boiled and pulp fiction are often used interchangeably, specific distinctions can and should be made. A hard-boiled detective movie is one where the detective himself is boiled hard. It's the story of someone who's been systematically broken into suspicious, detached character pieces, a character forced to live by their own rugged moral code. Now, at first, we don't realize the antisocial aspects of our protagonist, usually because the hard-boiled aspect seems to fit nicely within the criminal underworld. But in a hard-boiled movie, there is contrast, and the protagonist sometimes returns to an innocent setting away from the criminal element. And that's when we notice that he's been boiled hard. In the innocent setting, the protagonist seems rough around the edges, cynical, emotionless hard. And it's this contrast that allows the filmmaker to make social commentary. We see the dark and the light. We see the good and the bad, the hidden and the visible. And therefore, we start to wonder where truth lies. Are we all dangerous underneath when pushed to our limits? Is there darkness to every light, etc.? The micro itself evokes thematic questions. Now, the prime example of a hard-boiled detective would be Philip Marlowe in both The Big Sleep and Murder, My Sweet. Paul Schrader and Martin Scorsese's film Taxi Driver also does a great hard-boiled example. 
Even though Travis Bickle isn't a detective per se, he does serve the storytelling role of a demented hero trying to save a victim after connecting a bunch of, quote, clues about the criminals and crimes of our society. As opposed to a Pulp Fiction detective world where there is no light, only darkness. In a Pulp world, everything is dark. Everything is criminal. And here, the hard-boiled detective fits right in because everyone is hard-boiled. Pulp mysteries are more about a hard-boiled world than a hard-boiled person. A modern example of this micro would be the grossly under-recognized film Brick, released in 2005. And of course, I, I could go on and on. With 50 macro genres, and with each macro having an average of four micros, I mean, sometimes more, that, that's over 200 micro genres that we could discuss. But let me do one more, which will loop us back to super genres. Let's look briefly at the escape macro genre. Like the heist movie, there are four micro genres. A procedural escape movie where we feel like we're part of the team. An impossible escape movie where we're utterly amazed by the escape. And a tale of escape movie where we're entranced by the personal sacrifice. But there's a fourth micro, the non-prison escape escape movie. Wait, what?